thank you very much that it's really nice to be here and I, I really enjoyed the uh, the previous workshop which resonated quite a lot with some of the things that I'm going to say so in this presentation I'm going to be talking about the creative multilingualism project that's just been mentioned um, that I carried out with the the people named at the bottom of, the, of this slide so Creative multilingualism projects already been mentioned. That was part of the AHRC uh, Open World Research Initiative led by Oxford and involving um, a number of other universities for the particular version of, of the OURI project that I was involved in. And the, the overarching aim of that uh, OURI project was to develop a new paradigm for modern languages predicated on the intrinsic connection between multilingualism and creativity and as something that could potentially give learners more confidence and make language learning um, more enjoyable and better in, in many respects. So my strand was down the bottom here, strand seven, you can see it in amongst um, some other interesting strands to do with metaphor, naming, creative economy, etc. So I'm going to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, strand seven, which focused very much on whether the notion of creativity um, improved language learning outcomes for learners of French and German at, at secondary school and the relationship between creativity and, and language learning. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the context and theoretical background to that research, as well as referring to some previous studies that have investigated uh, similar issues, outline what we did in the study and give you some results and hopefully enable us to draw some conclusions from those findings. So, if we think about the relationship with language learning and, and creativity, this may already have been touched upon in, in previous sessions. So there are different definitions of creativity. It's something that's quite um, difficult to define, but in, in our project, we try to work with the definition that we have here as the, the ability to come up with novel yet appropriate solutions to a given problem often diverging from conventional thought patterns. But we were also influenced by um, other works on creativity that emphasize more the emotional and experience um, elements of creativity, which, which argues that people who are creative um, are flexible, prefer complex things, they are empathetic, curious, and they have a tolerance of ambiguity. And we saw those as characteristics which language learning the language classroom was in a particularly good place to to develop and that we might draw upon in our study now in terms of whether there is a relationship between creativity and language learning most of the evidence for a relationship comes from what i would call naturalistic bilingualism so people who grow up as being bilingual or who learn a language immersed in a setting rather than um, drawing on, on, on evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, from classrooms. So in naturalistic settings, there is evidence that bilingualism does improve mental flexibility. So a study in 2012 did find that bilingual learners, young learners did show greater cognitive flexibility. We know really very little though about whether learning to be bilingual or multilingual in a formal educational setting also enhances or is linked with general creativity. And there really has been a, a, you know, only a handful of studies to investigate that question quite surprisingly. And there is some limited evidence that it does. So the two studies here are fairly old now. Um, one with primary school learners, another with Basque, uh, learners in the Basque region, both showing that learning a language in a classroom does have a positive impact on general creativity, a concept that I'll come back to a bit later on. And so we were interested in this question as to whether creative teaching, creative teaching approaches, whether that enhances language learning in particular. And I'll come back in, in a moment as to what I mean by creative teaching. 
really I mean by that, that teaching language teaching where there is an emphasis on learners' emotions, their personal responses, an emphasis, emphasis on empathy and imagination. So does that have a, a more positive impact on creativity than, than just uh, language, teach, language teaching that we might call non-creative? And again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So again, these, these themes here on the next slide may already have been touched upon in, in your conference. Um, but, I, you know, a lot of people would argue that um, investigating some of these issues are particularly important in the context of England and in the UK more broadly, but our study was based in England, so that was our particular focus. And over a number of years, there has been lamentations that learners are not able to write and speak spontaneously or independently or engage in language in a meaningful way. And that is also then linked to um, vocabulary growth. Studies over the years, particularly this one in 2006 by Jim Milton, finding that learners of French in this case have very small estimated vocabulary sizes of about, 108, about 850 words, which is really very small, and that their vocabulary size grows very slowly during the time that they're in secondary school. Now, in terms of being creative with language, how much vocabulary you know, you know is, is really important. It's quite difficult to be particularly creative, arguably, with limited vocabulary size. And we also know that sort of lack of proficiency and being able to say the kind of things that you want to say um, in a language is linked to low motivation for an uptake of language learning. So learners feeling lacking in confidence, having low self-efficacy for language learning and to be being able to do and say the things they want to in that particular language. And uptake post 14 in secondary schools is really at an all time low in, in pretty much all parts of the UK. So an example of, of what learners feel about language learning, we gathered in the early stages of our project and in a, a pilot study. So we had one activity when we were gathering data whereby we asked learners to say what language learning was not like so learning a language is like if it was an if it was an animal what kind of animal would it be if it was a food what kind of a food would it be and some of the responses that learners gave as, as well as being quite amusing i think are, are quite insightful so on the one hand being really dull and quite painful but also impossible in many ways. So trying to fly, I just can't do it. And I think that the last um, statement here is particularly pertinent that this person realizing that learning a language is important, like eating a bowl of breakfast cereal, but it is kind of stodgy and, and you know, monotonous. It's what you do every day and therefore not something that you particularly want to do. So learners express some of those feelings of both on the one hand difficulty, impossibility in terms of learning a language, but also pain and monotony, not, not the place we would want them to be. The curriculum in England has tried to respond to some of those issues by um, incorporating aspects that we might consider to be uh, better able to promote creative and imaginative responses at key stage three primary level, um, introducing stories, songs and poems, key stage three, early secondary school, this idea of reading literary texts to stimulate ideas and creative expression, and at GCSE level, key stage four, age 16, those things then being reflected in learners' ability to be able to use language more creatively and to express ideas, feelings, and emotions. So the, cr the creative aspect is very much there in the curriculum, but the question is, is whether those things in practice are actually materializing in the classroom and are they having a positive impact? 
So let's turn a little bit now to think about why um, creative approaches, certain creative approaches might be useful for improving motivation for language learning in secondary schools. So the first rationale might be to do with um, the possibility to introduce cultural aspects and more interesting content. So I've already said that learners lack of interest and lack of confidence or self efficacy is strongly related to them giving up um, language study that's been shown in a number of studies over the years. On the other hand, we know that learners are motivated and want to learn languages and are prompted particularly by an intrinsic interest in language learning. So learning it for its own sake. And that includes interest in the second language culture rather than for any more um, instrumental uh, or extrinsic reasons. We know, however, that when learners move from primary school into secondary school, there is less focus on cultural aspects of language learning. And we also know that that transition phase is associated with a drop in intrinsic motivation. So that might be a clue to how we could use cultural aspects to um, foster greater motivation. Another study, an important study, found that learners' sense of personal relevance in what they studied and their perceptions of lessons were key factors that uh, predicted whether they chose to study a language at age 16 or not. So bringing in a creative element that has a cultural element, an intrinsic interest element might potentially lead to more motivated and better language learning. And so we toyed with the idea then of whether using literary or other authentic texts that were based in the culture of the target language, whether that could increase learners sense of personal relevance, their perceptions of language learning, and also their sense of achievement. Now that does pose challenges in that I've already said that learners tend to have a small vocabulary size, which might be an issue for using more stimulating materials. Okay, a quote there that talks about um, how if we want learners to get better at reading and other language related things that we need to give them a, a stimulating, stimulating diet. Okay, so the another rationale might be linked to um, the relationship between motivation for language learning and affect and emotions. So there is research that indicates that expressing emotions in language learning and enjoyment are closely linked, but that that emotional impact, that emotional component is um, too often ignored. And I really like this quotation here that classroom language lessons at, at secondary school can often be relatively emotion free and therefore essentially boring because there's there's little call for emotional investment from learners, little unpredictability, outburst, surprise. I mean, all those things then have potential for embarrassment or risk taking and anxiety. But the studies by these colleagues here found that anxiety actually didn't increase when there was greater unpredictability. So the emotional risk-taking element was strongly linked to um, enjoyment and emotions. So again, coming back to confidence, we, you know, we found in, in, the, in a pilot of, of the study that I'm going to be talking about here, that one of the things learners really wanted to be able to do, but they weren't confident in doing, was to express their thoughts and feelings. And those things, their levels of confidence in being able to do that, predicted how likely they were to want to continue with a language after 14. So feelings seem to be an important aspect to, to look at. And arguably literature and, author and authentic texts do provide opportunities for exploration and expression of emotion, empathy, intercultural understanding and hence creativity, and therefore have more potential for prompting interaction within the language classroom. But that isn't necessarily the case, however, because other studies 
emphasize that how we use any of these more creative texts or materials is absolutely crucial for how um, they impact on learners. So um, do we have any evidence that using literary and other authentic texts is actually beneficial? I've said already that the curriculum in England kind of assumes that there is already evidence for their beneficial impact. However, we actually have really little evidence of how they do affect school learners, motivational and linguistic development. So most previous studies have focused on adults and on just motivation rather than on language development. And I would argue that if we want to see what benefits there are, um, we need to focus on both of those things. And in terms of whether literature as something that a time kind of text that is potentially more creative than a, than a non-literary text, there is almost no study that compares those two kinds of texts together. But what uh, researchers argue and agree on, I should say, coming back to this point, is that how whatever text it is, is being used is crucial, but we don't really, we haven't really got much consensus about what the most appropriate forms of use is. So should we be having a language based model or a personal growth focus if we're using literature and other creative texts with learners. So let's look a little bit more about what those approaches might be. So here are a few approaches to using literature in language learning that are um, that are outlined. So I've talked about um, a language based approach. So in the language based approach, the focus is very much of using a literary text really as a focus to practice language. So grammar, vocabulary, but in the personal growth approach, the priority is given to using the literary text as a as a as a way to um, engage in and reflect on personal experience. So as a means to engage students in the reading process. And arguably that might lead to greater engagement and hence better learning with the possibilities of more motivated learning through the exploration of students' feelings and through more meaningful contexts. And there is a good rationale that that might be beneficial through theories that talk about how vocabulary learning can be enhanced through more involved pro processes. So Laufer and Hulsten talk about involvement as being key to vocabulary growth. So involvement and engagement really talks about how hard learners have to think about the words they are meeting. So do they need to use a word or um, reuse a word that's in a text? Is there a motivational component? So do they really want to understand something to get to the end of a story rather than being told to do so by a teacher? Do they have to ha exert some sort of mental effort to discover a word's meaning? And do they have to evaluate it? So do they have to make some kind of decision about a word they're encountering? So that might be, for example, deciding whether a word in a text really conveys a particular message or a feeling. And again, I would say that using literary and other authentic texts might increase opportunities for engagement in those ways. So that's some of the background to our study. Coming back to what we were fundamentally um, looking at. So does creativity improve language learning outcomes for learners of French and German and secondary school? And we investigated that broad question with around 600 learners of French in year nine, so age 14 approximately in England. And we wanted to look particularly on how learners reading, writing, vocabulary and general creativity developed in two kinds of teaching approaches. And we were also looking at how their motivation for and beliefs about language learning changed. 
So we worked with um, around 16 uh, schools and around about 20 teachers. And our teachers were put into two groups. So on the one hand, we had a group of teachers who used factual text, so magazine article type materials that really didn't contain figurative language very much. And then we had another group of teachers who used literary texts, namely poems, that were highly figurative in the language that they used. Now, both text types were matched so that they included language of similar difficulty level and they addressed similar themes. Now, the themes that we addressed were really ones that people don't particularly address with 14 year olds in language lessons in class. So love, death, migration and otherness, potentially um, quite thought provoking topics, because we, again, we wanted to provoke some kind of emotion, emotional responses in learners. And, and therefore we felt we had to have those kinds of topics. So all teachers in both groups employed their particular text type in two ways. On the one hand, in what we call a functional approach. And in the second way, what we called the creative approach over an approximately eight months. And I'll explain a little bit more about those two approaches in a moment. So here is an example of what the study looked like. So this uses the French class as an example. So we've got our two text groups here. On the one hand, the literary group. On the other hand, the factual, factual group. We tested learners at the beginning of the study and then we implemented the first phase of the intervention. So classes studied three texts over seven weeks. They spent 60 minutes on each of those texts plus 20 minutes for homework. So teachers either started with the creative approach or the functional approach. We then tested learners again. After that, the second phase began, three more texts over the same period of time. And this time each teacher swapped approach. So if they'd used the creative approach with the first set of texts, they used the functional approach with the next set of texts and so forth. That's really to ensure that the order in which you experience an approach doesn't influence the, the impact overall. Okay, just a quick slide to give you an idea of the kinds of text that we use. So these are the poems that we use with the French group. Um, poems that are fairly commonly used in secondary schools. And then we either found or wrote ourselves or modified semi authentic texts that um, dealt with the same topic and reused some of the core language. And crucially, we matched the texts, all the texts that we used on, on levels of difficulty. So on readability, the length of the, of the text, the number of long words, and, and crucially the difficulty level. So on this scale here, if a text um, has a score of between 20 and 25, it's classed as very easy. And our texts, the, the easiest text had a score of 16. Our hardest text had a, a score of 38. So none of our texts would be classed as particularly difficult. On average, they were moderately easy. So let's talk a bit more about the approaches that we use. So let's start with the creative approach. So in the creative approach, the teacher's aim of using whatever text type they have is to generate a personal involvement from the learner with an attention to emotional content, metaphors or concepts within the text. In the functional approach, the overarching aim is on factual information processing, finding out what happened, what the facts are, attention to form, such as grammar, and how language is used to carry out functions. 
Now in a lesson or, or pairs of lessons that might take the following format. So in the creative approach, a teacher might begin a lesson by presenting some images and ask learners about the emotions that those images evoke for them. In the functional approach, images would be presented and learners would be asked to talk about what facts or events they might think of. So let's say a um, picture of a, a, um, a horse outside, the, the, the emotional side would, would, would ask, you know, what does this picture make you feel? In the functional approach, a learner might be asked, you know, what, what, what activity does this make you think of? Then at a later stage in a lesson, a teacher might use a picture story based on the text and the learners will be asked to order the pictures to focus on the emotional state of the characters in the text. Whereas in the more functional approach, the focus would be on sequencing it for events and facts. And then finally, if learners were asked to read aloud or to read a text while listening, in the creative approach, they will be focusing on the emotions expressed through intonation patterns. And in the functional approach, the focus would be on sound spelling correspondences. This slide, actually, I'm not going to go through um, in too much detail because of, of time. It, it kind of outlines how we matched the two approaches with, with a poem. We tended to start poems, lessons involving poems by presenting some information about the poet themselves. Firstly, in the creative approach, talking about their values, what things were important to them from a feeling point of view. Whereas in the functional approach, it was about facts, dates, etc. Then we would use promote prediction. What do you think, what kind of emotions do you think you're, you might experience when reading this poem? In the functional approach, what kinds of events might occur in this poem? And then including translation activities, the creative approach is focusing on which version of a two different translations would be more expressive, better able to convey the emotions. Whereas in the functional approach, it was very much looking at correctness. So that's some idea of what the, the different approaches were. Um, this is an and further example, a German uh, text that we use, Matter of Fact Romance, a text that's based very much uh, using the simple past in German, therefore grammatically, it would be an ideal vehicle for teaching and practicing the simple past which is how we used it in the functional approach. We focused on grammar teaching and in the homework learners were set, they had to write a summary of the poem using the simple past, saying what happened in the poem about a man and a woman going into a cafe. In the creative approach, our focus was on the emotional tone of the poem and for homework learners had to write a happy ending for it. For it. Um, using the format of a film script, what uh, the man and the woman might have said to express their emotions. We also drew on art, um, visual art. So a poem uh, based in the surreal, surrealism period, asking learners to think about which of these pictures here best evoked um, the mood of one of the poems that we use. So that would be in the creative condition. So just a, a quick slide there where it's showing how we matched um, poems and, and literary and non-literary texts. OK, so what did we find out? What did we do to find out what impact these had? So we were interested in linguistic outcomes, reading, writing and vocabulary. We had a number of tasks for those. I, I'll come back to those where it's relevant. And we also looked at non-linguistic outcomes. So first of all, attitudes and motivations, which we assessed through questionnaires and interviews. And then also creativity, general creativity, which I'll talk a fair amount about because I think that's our most interesting finding. We assessed that using a, a psychological test called the abbreviated Torrance test. So those were some of the measures that we used. So what did we find? Okay. 
key findings. We had lots of findings, we had lots of data. So let's turn to vocabulary first. So we assessed vocabulary size using a test that's called XLEX. Now we had quite different outcomes for learners of German from the learners of French. And disappointingly, the impact on learners of German from our study was pretty small really. And so learners of German made really very modest gains in vocabulary size over the period of the project. The gains were not statistically significant. And very interestingly, the biggest effect on how much learners vocabulary grew was actually which school they were in, which perhaps tells us that the teachers in the, in the German classes weren't necessarily implementing the intervention in the way that we might have hoped. Much more positively, however, and really interestingly, the learners in the French group overall in both text types, in both conditions, made very large vocabulary gains of around 300 words over the year. Now, if you remember from an earlier slide, I said that a previous study had found that learners of French on average in England learn a hundred, they increase their vocabulary size by about 170 words. So a, a, an increase in 300 is really quite large. And very interestingly, learners who were taught using the creative approach in the second phase made the largest improvement with an estimated increase of French vocabulary size of nearly 600, which is really massive. Now that's the creative approach, regardless of the text type. So the text type didn't seem to make any difference particularly, although one caveat coming up later on, it was the creative approach that, that was the most helpful. We also looked at whether learners learnt the vocabulary items that were introduced in the text themselves. And again, most of the learners made significant vocabulary gains. But this time, the greatest gains were made by learners who were taught using the creative approach and the literary text in the first phase. So there's a definite um, indication that the creative approach is more beneficial for learners of French in terms of vocabulary and some evidence that the, the poems were the most beneficial. Looking at reading, Again, German, no significant improvement on either comprehension or confidence using um, texts that were not related to the intervention itself. For French, learners who, were in the create, who experienced the creative approach or when learners experienced the creative approach, regardless of the text type, they became more confident in reading, but there was no difference for comprehension. Let's look a little bit now at the writing. So for our writing task, we wanted to try to tap into some kind of linguistic creativity for learners. So for this task, we asked them to look at a picture, the picture that you see here. And we asked them to write about it in French or German, saying whatever they wanted to, as long as it relates to the picture. And they should write about half a page to one page. Learners found that incredibly difficult because they were just not used to having that kind of really open ended task, being able to be creative. They just weren't used to it. Some of them wrote very little. So we looked at what gains might be made through a number of ways. So first of all, we looked at how much they wrote, the number of words. For both languages, we found that there was a negative relationship between making progress in the number of words used from one point of the study to the other for the creative approach and gains for the functional approach. That's quite complicated as a concept. So what that means is that learners who gained more from the creative approach gained much less from the functional approach and vice versa. So that what that really means for writing is that someone who benefits from one approach will not benefit from another. And that really indicates that learners are very individual in both their preferences for and what helps them. So really that's an important message, I think, that if we're thinking about so-called creative language teaching, 
emphasis on emotions, that that might not be helpful for everyone. That's probably obvious, but I think it's a really interesting finding. If we look at lexical diversity, so the diversity of the language learners used, there were equal gains in both text groups and approaches, but only for those who experienced first the functional approach followed by the creative approach. Now, there may be reasons for that that I haven't got time to talk about here, but perhaps it could be to do with, you know, getting the basics of being able to use a more difficult text type first and then being more creative later when you encounter a similar text again. In terms of grammatical complexity, there were similar significant gains in the literary text groups in both languages, but not the factual text group. Okay, let's come to the creativity um, results, which I said was perhaps, is perhaps the most interesting finding because it's the most novel finding potentially. The test that we use, the uh, ATTA, assesses learners' verbal creativity through a problem of identification task where learners have to write in English as many problems as they can if they imagine they could fly without an aeroplane. It also um, assesses nonverbal creativity through a couple of picture completion tasks. And both tasks are scored for fluency in terms of the number of relevant ideas produced, the originality of those ideas, how much those ideas are elaborated on and how flexible learners seem to be um, in terms of the number of different categories or solutions they produce. So this is an example of the kind of things that learners might have to do. So they are given a shape and they have to use those shapes to draw pictures, whatever they, they, they would like to within about three minutes. I personally would find this a really difficult task. I don't think I'm particularly creative, but not on this kind of task anyway. I would find this particularly uh, difficult, but it's a very well-established test and um, it gave us some interesting findings. So we used those measures with learners over the different time points of our study. And what did we find? So if we look at overall creativity scores, which um, combines all the different measures that I've just talked about, so the overall trend that we had across both languages combined was that there was there was significant gains for learners who studied the poems over the year, but not for the factual text group. And you can see from this graph, hopefully, that the blue group, the, the, um, the literary group, the poems group, they increased from the pretest to the post-test, but the green group, the factual test group, their creativity actually declined over the year. We do have, however, quite a complex picture and that there, in that there were differences between French and German and the teaching approach that the learners experienced in different phases. So some graphs here, which I hope are not too complex. Really the main one that we need to look at See if I can point to this with my cursor. The, 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 the gains were really limited to the French creative literary text group. So learners who in the poems group, when they experience those poems through a creative teaching approach, their general creativity increased by a large amount over the year. And you hopefully can see that through the steep slope in the line here, that line representing the creative approach, this flat line here representing the functional approach. And in the functional French group, there were decreases in both approaches, the literary group for German gains in both approaches and no changes for the factual group. So I think that's a really important and interesting finding that studying poems in French through a creative approach does have an impact on learners' general creativity. Now, in terms of motivation, I've just got a little bit here on what learners thought about the, the uh, being in part of this study and studying these texts. 
Um, we gave them a questionnaire and asked them to rate things on, on a scale of one to six, six, six being the most positive. Again, I think it's really important to note that there was a huge range of uh, responses. So in one class of learners, you'd have responses ranging from one to six, huge range. So on average, they were not particularly positive, I have to say, disappointingly. So around about three is kind of um, neutral. It was OK. But there were some quite interesting differences um, between how helpful and interesting they found the two approaches within the text types. So these little asterisks and the bold text indicates where there was a significant difference. So for the creative approach for French, that was significantly more helpful, according to learners, than the functional approach in both text groups. For the German though, the absolute opposite was the case. So learners of German found the functional approach much more helpful for learning regardless of the text type and that perhaps says something a little bit perhaps about the nature of the two languages nature of learners preferences and the learner and the languages that they choose to study okay and just a, a couple of quick reactions from teachers um, about what they felt about being involved in the project so teachers valued i think the opportunity to do something different um, their learners found the materials moving, enjoyed interest uh, and emphasis on cultural aspects. They felt that they were more engaged and motivated. A learner here in the blue box enjoyed talking about their, their feelings and finding that more engaging. And the teacher at the end really finding it quite empowering and liberating to use texts of a factual as well as a literary kind that looked at topics and concepts beyond what is normally introduced in a textbook. So what can we conclude from that? Well, first of all, for language teaching pedagogy that we can use literary and authentic texts with learners and doing so does have some benefit for some learners for their vocabulary learning, for their writing in the foreign language, their creativity and confidence. But that there is diversity and we need to think about that. So while on the one hand, activities with a creative and emotional element are preferred by some learners, and for some learners, these are more helpful for learning, that is not the case for other learners and that different text types and activity types appeal to and help different learners in different ways. And that may also correspond to language variations as well. That means then again, that there is, it's really important as I'm sure all teachers know anyway, that we have a blended approach in our teaching that combines these functional and creative approaches within the same lesson and over a series of lessons to cater for that variation. And then in terms of the curriculum, that actually I think the curriculum and what we're saying to teachers about what they should include should really be based on, on evidence that examines the impact of teaching approaches as well as choice of materials if we really want to maximise learning and motivation. And that's particularly the case when classroom time is so limited as it is in this country. So that I think that's, that's me for today. All I've got to say um, apart from questions. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you have.